Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation from Make It Labs for our weekly Make It Smarter series on a project called MicroRat. Like most makerspaces in the world, we have this continuing problem of managing access to our building and to our tools. And like all those other makerspaces, we have developed our own solutions. So over the last 10 or more years, we've been developing multiple systems for RFID access control, mainly to our outside doors to let people in and out of the space. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson here. 2010, Make It Labs is founded in Lowell, Massachusetts on Tanner Street. And the very first RFID access control system was based on an off-the-shelf doorknob and an Arduino and a laptop and uh, some Google Apps code that was taken from another makerspace. An adaptation of that was carried over to our new facility in Nashua, New Hampshire. That was still running on uh, Windows PC with Python code and uh, that Google Apps backend. It was very unreliable. Anyone who was around back then remembers that it would crash all the time. There was a system developed for the Rabbit Laser that we got. That's a standalone system. It was not tied into any authentication. So you would locally add tags to it and it would allow people to use the laser cutter. There was another standalone system developed for the MakerBot 3D printer in 2014. And then in 2015, we had our first interior door project. We built a wood shop in what we called the bunker in our old building. And the door to that was controlled with a pie based system. In early 2015, late 2016, we were getting ready to move into our new space here on Crown Street. And to go along with that, we developed a new web based authentication backend that allowed resource managers and the board to go in and control access for individual members. When we opened our door in the new space, we had a brand new door bot that was running the front door. It was based on a Raspberry Pi and some new Python code. So that PC that used to crash all the time was gone. And it was around this time that we started to throw around this idea of what we call RAT, which stands for RFID All the Things. And the first attempt at a platform for that was based on the ESP8266, but due to some technical reasons, we didn't pursue that much further. Then we started to explore the ESP32 platform, which was a newer, fancier, more capable version of that ESP8266. Unfortunately, at the time it was brand new and the software was not very reliable, so we abandoned that. Around that time, we got the new Tormach CNC mill and I developed a system on that, which was kind of based on the doorbot code, but it was starting to give access control to a tool that was tied into the backend system, but it wasn't really RAT yet. In 2018, what would actually become RAT as we know it now was based on a Pi0W and some new Python code and started out with a hand-wired prototype. And then in 2018 to 2019, we basically developed two different versions of a PC board and uh, some mechanical design and all that stuff. And what you now see as RAT around the space is based on that. And during this time, the authentication backend that we mentioned before uh, was updated to support all this new stuff. Traditionally, our door bots, which control access to our exterior doors, were built around Raspberry Pis and a bunch of hand-wired peripherals. But in 2019, built a new version of the DoorBot based around a Pi 3, the power of Ethernet shield, and a custom PC board. In 2020, despite the pandemic, we did roll out RAT on a couple of new tools, including the new Bridgeport Prototrack CNC mill and the new Everlast TIG welder. In late 2020, I decided I wanted to re-explore the idea of an ESP32 based RAT. The Raspberry Pi RAT that we build is a uh, quite a capable platform, but it is kind of overkill for a lot of uses. Specifically, I knew I wanted to start thinking about controlling access to interior doors and things like cabinets and toolboxes, and I, I didn't want to deploy Raspberry Pi to all those. So the ESP32 came back to my mind, especially since I'd heard that the software platform had matured quite a bit. So I started down the path of developing a new prototype and doing a schematic PC board layout and the first application I wanted to apply it to was to an electronic doorknob lock. And that is the focus of the majority of this talk. So what are the goals here of this project? First, we want to solve the problem of interior door access control at the space. So we've got rooms like the server room, the board office, the bio lab, facility storage closet, new rooms upstairs like the ham shack and the media room and the rental offices. But we also want the platform to be adaptable to other applications. So cabinet doors in the clean space parts room, for example, toolboxes like the Tormach toolbox, the welding toolbox, the plasma cutter toolbox, that sort of thing. We want to revisit the ESP32 as a basis for the platform now that uh, the development tools are a lot better. 
Unlike the original Flavor Rat, we want this version to potentially support use cases where it does not have constant power. In other words, it has to work off of battery power and support sleep-wake capability. It should support the same APIs that the current Rat and DoorBot systems do. And we want to provide a good user experience, but not with as many features as the full-blown Rat. So the first step was doing some shopping on Amazon.com looking for a potential donor smart lock. Looking for a doorknob here that had a plastic bezel on the front. That way our RFID and Wi-Fi would have no problem working. This one looked like a great candidate because right out of the box it supports RFID and wireless key fob. So our stuff should have no problem working in there once we retrofit it in. Price is a little higher than I hoped at $120 since we'd be throwing a lot of it away, but it is still cheaper than the $200 Schlage's and the like. So we got one ordered up and received it in and I installed it on a door to test it. And uh, you can see that it's your typical electronic door lock, except this one has a capacitive sensitive keypad on the front, which is kind of nice versus some buttons, but you know, this probably doesn't work with gloves and things like that. So that would be a little frustrating does support RFID, but with some digging, I found that it's actually 13 megahertz and not the 125 kilohertz type that we use at the labs. It also supports this uh, remote key fob, which I can't imagine us needing that at the labs either, but maybe if you have this on a home or something like that, that would make some sense. Thankfully, it also does have a emergency backup key. Uh, you take off this little magnet door on the front and uh, they use a really funky side-channeled key that uh, you slot in there, and when you put it in, the doorknob functions as normal. Um, this is really important because if the electronics fail for any reason or the batteries die or something like that, you need to be able to get in. On the inside, uh, there's a battery compartment underneath this plastic door. You just pop it off. There's four double A's inside. Uh, we won't be using those. Basically, take the batteries out. Take out a few screws and you can separate the inside portion from the outside portion. And you'll see that there's a cable that goes between the two. There's a, a quick disconnect connector uh, that just brings battery power up to the front, basically. Uh, pop that off. There's this rubber gasket that helps the cable uh, pass through the doorway a little bit easier. But let's get this thing on the bench and take it apart. So ordinarily, there'd be four screws that you'd have to remove to take this back plate off. Uh, I've had this thing apart so many times that I only put it together with a couple of screws just to keep it easier. So this gold-colored block on the back of this plate that you see here is where most of the magic happens in this lock. This two-pin connector goes to a DC motor that's inside the block. The DC motor is actually part of a little linear actuator. That linear actuator works in conjunction with a mechanism that connects and disconnects the exterior knob from the latch mechanism that keeps the door locked essentially. When you drive the motor in one direction, the exterior knob allows the latch to work. And when the motor is driven in the other direction, it doesn't. And it stays in place when you're not driving it. So the electronics um, are in the front part of the knob. They're all pretty much behind that keypad that we saw earlier. Uh, it's just held in with four screws. I've only got two of them installed here because like I said, this thing's been apart several times. Um, the whole thing pops out as a module, um, and you can see it's two PC boards. There's this uh, top board, which has the majority of the electronics, and then a board for the uh, CapSense buttons on the front panel. Um, I always like to pull stuff apart and kind of reverse engineer it and just understand the decisions they made, and this was kind of interesting. There were some cool things they did on the uh, CapSense board uh, that I thought were kind of clever. Uh, on the main board, I've got the, uh, this is the antenna and the module for that RF receiver for the key fob. There's a PIC microcontroller, an NXP uh, MyFair RFID reader for 13 megahertz RFID, piezo beeper, there's like an E-squared prom and stuff on there too. Uh, and that other board has the uh, CapSense stuff on it, so I'll just pop that off here quickly. Uh, so on the front panel board, there is a CapSense chip, which is used to read the uh, CapSense keypad. Um, there's also a bunch of LEDs that get driven underneath the keys. We saw those earlier. There's also this three pin JST connector on the other side. And I believe that is used for the 13 megahertz RFID. I think they put the antenna for that on the circuit board that's in the front. Um, so it's kind of a cool little package. They, they've got a couple clever things going on here. But really, come on, let's be honest. We don't care that much about the electronics that this lock came with. 
Sure, they're fine and they work, uh, but they're not going to get us any closer to uh, integrating this thing with our authentication system and making it part of DoorBot and RAT and all that other cool stuff we have at the Makerspace. So let's get to work. Because this is a heavily mechanical project, uh, it has to fit into the enclosure as it exists. I decided to start off by modeling up a replacement for the plastic bezel that used to house the keypad. So I measured up the critical dimensions, started a model in Fusion, and then did a 3D print to get a first article that we could do some test fitting with. And this is that first print, and you can see the fit was actually really nice. So this was a good basis for uh, continuing to evolve the design. So this is the second one. You can see that it's actually got a cutout for an LCD. Uh, this was for a prototype LCD that I happen to have around. Uh, but it's starting to look pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this mechanical package. This is uh, the fourth revision. You can see there's the RFID reader and a display actually mounted in there. You can also see it actually protrudes from the front, unlike the, uh, the stock one or the earlier prototypes. And that was so that I can put more space between our PC board and the RFID reader in particular, because it will perform better if it's not near other surfaces. Uh, also gives more room for cabling and access and things like that. So it's starting to come together. This is the hand-wired prototype that I put together as the starting point for the electronics. You can see it's based around an ESP32 uh, evaluation module, and that's just soldered down onto a piece of uh, breadboard prototyping uh, circuit board. This is a motor controller board that I just popped off there. Uh, the other board that's visible on there is a uh, SD card breakout. And I've just got it hand-wired together with um, wire wrap wire like you typically do for these hand-wired prototypes. And you can see here I'm connecting up the display and the RFID reader. Uh, those are just coming in on some 0.1 headers. Um, and uh, the whole thing actually fits right inside the doorknob. Uh, unlike some prototypes that I build, I tried to make this one actually fit in the physical enclosure, mainly so that I could test out the Wi-Fi reception when it's in the case with all that metal. I hoped there wouldn't be any issues and it turned out there weren't, but it was worth uh, doing this to test it. So as I was finishing up that hand-wired prototype, I started to get the schematic drawn in KiCad. And I always like to do these two things in conjunction. I'm kind of winding down the, um, the hand-wired prototype phase, and I like to transfer all that knowledge, everything that I learned in the hand-wired prototype, into what will become the final design. And it's good for capturing what GPIOs I specifically used, especially with a module like the ESP, where different IOs have different constraints and limitations on them. Sometimes it's you try something out, it doesn't work. You have to move to a different pin. Um, also lets you capture any other oddities that you may encounter, uh, specific pull-up values you need, things like that. And while that hand-wired prototype certainly did not have all of the circuitry that I planned on putting in the final one, it gets the core of the design basically tight before you commit it. I have it split up into three pages. I kind of have this main page that we're on here. This contains the ESP, uh, SD card, uh, USB serial, front panel, uh, the Grove interface and the RFID interface. And then I've got separate sheets for power supply, lithium ion charger, motor control, and then uh, the front panel is its own separate page. What we're looking at right here is the ESP module itself. The ESP module uh, is a solderable module, uh, carries an FCC approval, basically has a microcontroller, uh, the spy flash, uh, and the board trace antenna, all in a, a canned package that you can just buy for a few dollars and solder down and you get a basically a working uh, controller core with Wi-Fi. The right-hand side here are all the GPIOs it has. As I mentioned earlier, some of these have constraints and restrictions on them because of the way the chip works. Some of them are used for bootstrapping. Uh, when you boot the chip up, it boots up in different ways if you have the pins tied high or low. Um, so it is tricky to use those as actual IOs uh, when they have to be strapped in a certain way for the uh, for the bootloader. Uh, you can see I've used pretty much every single I.O. that's available. I think the LCD probably consumes the most. You can see it's like five or six pins worth anything with a LCD prefix. Uh, the SD card is only a three pin interface. Uh, it's not too bad. Some miscellaneous, a couple for the motor control, uh, some power management stuff, and the beeper and the button and all kinds of other stuff. Over here in this section, this is the... Uh, the micro SD socket. Uh, it's fairly nice. You don't have to do very much in three wire mode. It's just three pins that connect over to the ESP. You do have to pay very special attention to all these pull ups. Um, and some of these actually uh, have contention with the aforementioned uh, bootstrapping pins, but you can get it all to work. So the ESP 
module is programmed over a serial port. And most modules that you buy will have a USB to serial converter on them. Uh, you plug your USB in, they show up as a serial device, and then the development tools open up that serial port, blast a bunch of data at the bootloader to flash new code onto it. This is fairly straightforward. It's just a, um, a USB to serial chip. Uh, and this stuff over here on the right-hand side of it isn't for the serial port per se, but it is um, part of the automatic programming scheme that uh, most of these off-the-shelf modules have. These two pins, the EN and the IO0, connect to the ESP. They're connected to um, flow control lines on the serial port, and the programming software uh, in the development tools basically will twiddle those lines and allow it to reboot the ESP into the bootloader automatically. So you don't have to like flip switches or press buttons. All you do is just type make flash in the development tools and it will just download your code. Over here in the lower right, we've got a couple of interfaces to the real world. This is the interface to the RFID module. We have standardized on a particular RFID reader uh, that I bought 30 or so of from China when we started doing the RAT development. Those actually run on five volts, so we have to supply five volts to them, and then you get serial data back from the module, which is also five volt logic level. So I just have a very simple level conversion scheme here where I've just got a voltage divider, and uh, it protects the ESP uh, from getting pin damage uh, from too high a voltage coming in on those pins. Uh, there's also some very simple uh, clamp diodes on here just for additional protection and current limiting resistors, things like that. There's also options to populate this uh, for 3.3 volts. So say in the future we find a module that is 3.3 uh, volt RFID. All we do is populate a different uh, ferrite bead here. Uh, it'll power it with 3 volts and you can change the values of the divider and the thing should work with a 3 volt, no problem. So this is the uh, Grove section. Grove is a standard from Seed Studio to basically allow hobbyists to do quick interconnection of things like relays and sensors and displays. Um, it can either be two digital IOs or it's an I2C bus. And we put four of those on the original RAT, the big one, so that we can hook up to these various types of things very easily. Uh, it's just a nice quick way to do that and the, the modules are available fairly cheap from a lot of different places. So I wanted to put at least one of those onto this design as well. Ordinarily, I think this is going to be used as just two standard inputs and outputs, and I've got them actually labeled with a kind of intention here. Uh, one is an alarm input. That alarm may actually be tied to a uh, like a read alarm sensor that you'd have on the door so that this thing can know whether the door is open or not. Uh, the other one's just labeled as expansion, but these could also be an I2C bus, SCL and SDA. And that could be useful in the future if we want to do something that this board doesn't support, but we can find an I2C board or a peripheral that will do it. Uh, we can add that on there. Up here, we've got the front panel section. This is actually the interface to the front panel. All it is is a bunch of IOs. It's all the LCD pins, the beeper, and the uh, button that's on the front panel. And then there's just ground and power. This is just for ESD protection. And then the front panel itself is off on another sheet. So I'll click into that. I just have it all drawn on a separate page. That way it can be lifted up and, and spun as a separate board or it can be done as a little breakout. The signals come from the main board uh, over a flat flex connector. There's just some protection, um, a circuit for the backlight, circuit to drive the uh, piezo beeper, and a circuit for the button. And then there's this little tiny uh, 0.96 um, TFT display that we uh, will have mounted to that board. And then the last section is probably the least exciting, but it's probably one of the most important. This is uh, power supply, battery charging, and uh, motor control. Uh, this borrows a little bit from the original RAT. Uh, Adam Shry and I designed a, uh, a nice little power switching and battery charging circuit for the original RAT. This lets you run this board off of a, a 5 volt input, so just a wall wart or something like that. Uh, but it will also charge a one cell lithium polymer battery, and this thing can potentially run on that either for a short term, let's say it's a power loss situation and you want the thing to stay running, it could do that. Or I envision this may be used in cases, um, say for a cabinet door, where it normally is in deep sleep powered down mode. The user would come up, wake it up, tag in, it would let them into that cabinet door, and then it can shut itself back off again. That would be the case where it's something that's not used very often. So I tried to design the power supply circuit uh, and charging stuff to support either use case. Other cases, I think we're going to be able to wire permanent power to the door, and I think that's a much better use case. That way the things can stay up. 
they can report back status to our uh, authentication backend and things like that. But I thought it was important to encompass that battery powered stuff. So we've got this auto switching power mocks. Basically, this is what selects between incoming power from the uh, external source and the LiPo output. And this chip is kind of clever. It, it'll automatically do that. There's a little truth table here that shows how it chooses from one of the two inputs. Uh, when one of them drops below the other one, it switches automatically. It also provides some uh, status output on this power loss signal uh, that is read back um, by the ESP. So it can know that power has changed from external to battery. And then there's also a signal that comes from the ESP called shutdown. And that allows the ESP to basically power this whole thing down. We do exactly the same thing in RAT. If you've ever unplugged a RAT, say on one of the welders, and you see that it stays running and shuts itself down 10 or 15 seconds later, when it shuts itself off, it's using the same function. Above that, we've got the uh, one cell lithium polymer charger circuit. Um, this is lifted pretty much directly out of RAT. The only thing is I added on a battery disconnect switch because I think there are cases where we're going to want to service this thing and just be able to power it off entirely. Over here, we've got two 3.3 volt LDOs, uh, low dropout linear regulators. Why two, you ask? Well, one of them is going to be constantly powered. That's going to run the ESP and the other core functionality, all the stuff that needs to be powered all the time. The other one is actually switched on and off under control by the ESP over a GPIO pin, this power enable that you see here. And that will allow us to power down peripherals that we don't need to use, particularly when we're running in the battery situation. So if we don't need the display or we don't need the SD card or whatever while we're in deep sleep mode, hopefully this will allow us to shut the power rail off and then with careful control of uh, the IO pins going to those peripherals, I'm hoping parasitics won't be a problem and we can actually have that stuff shut off when we don't need to use them. Above that, this is a five volt boost converter. Um, there are a couple of things on here that need five volts. So the RFID reader is one of them because the module that we chose is five volts. We need that to be able to run reliably. Also, our motor uh, needs five volts or six volts or so. So I did use one of the options on here. I populated the stuff up in this top section to be able to generate a 10 volt output. And I made that an option in the motor control, which we'll see in a moment. So that let's say we're using this in some other case and somebody wants to use a 12 volt motor for something. Let's say we're making a cabinet door lock from scratch uh, and the motor we want to use is 12 volts. 10 volts is pretty close to 12. It'll work for a DC motor. It just runs a little bit slower. Uh, populating this should let us generate a 10 volt signal that we can optionally run into the motor control. And that's a good segue right into this. Uh, this is a little tiny chip, which can run a DC motor um, up to, I think it's like three quarters of an amp or something like that. Um, it's uh, essentially like an H bridge, but it's got a little bit more um, intelligence inside of it. Uh, you give it two inputs, uh, basically, and depending on what the logic state of those inputs are, it'll run forward or backwards. Uh, it'll be off or it can be braked. Um, and like I said, it's got the option to either run it off of that five volt switched or the 10 volt. So that pretty much wraps up the schematic. You can study this. It's, it's available in our GitHub if you want to take a look at it in more depth and uh, check it out. So it's kind of an engineering truism that things seem linear when you look at them in retrospect, but the reality is generally uh, not quite so clean. Uh, in truth, you're jumping between your schematic, your PC board, your mechanical design, and arriving at a, a final design that you think will work before you uh, commit to it for fabrication. And coming up with a board shape is no exception. Um, since I did not model the outer enclosure of this knob, I had to basically just iterate on uh, shapes to come up with a PC board shape that would work. And I use one of my favorite tried and true methods of coming close in CAD, printing it out on a piece of paper, cutting it out, and then just test fitting it and seeing where the interferences are and adjusting. And it only took three or four tries before I got kind of an admittedly weird shape that fit, but uh, it let me optimize that space without having to go through the effort of drawing a model for that thing. So the reality is I actually started doing at least the parts placement before I had that board shape finalized. So I just, I chose a rectangle that was approximately the right size and started to put parts down like you do and make sure everything seems like it's going to fit. And I wanted to stick with parts that were going to be solderable. So all the discretes or 603s are bigger. Um, there's some fine pitch parts on here. There's half millimeter uh, connectors and stuff like that, but it's all within reason if you've if you're fairly skilled at this stuff 
I also opted to do this as a four layer board. Um, it's so cheap from China these days to do that, um, that I just hate messing around routing power and ground all over the place on a two layer. It also helps make the board a little bit more robust. Um, it is really nice to just drop vias down to power and ground planes though, and, and not have to worry about it. I also decided to do this uh, as a board with a separate breakaway for the front panel. I do kind of re regret that decision. Um, it would have been cheaper to do that as a separate two layer board from the particular board house that we used. Also in hindsight, I wish I had not put the majority of the parts for that little front panel break off board on the bottom side. Um, that meant that I couldn't use a single solder paste stencil uh, and place all the components when it's in this panelized form. That was just a dumb oversight. It's just the way I ended up drawing it mechanically and just didn't feel like redoing it. Uh, but I think next time, like I said, I would do separate two layer board. I'll split that stuff off and uh, keep the main board simple. So just before Christmas, I sent off the Gerber files for the PC board design to our fab house in China, allpcb.com. And I also sent off the stencil files to Osh Stencils and I decided to do polyamide, uh, the cheaper plastic stencil for this instead of stainless steel. And you can see here that I've set up a jig using some old PC boards uh, for framing reference and have the polyamide stencil aligned. Put down some solder paste using the uh, plastic credit card type tool. Scrape that off, lift up the stencil and you've got solder paste that's ready to go, uh, ready to accept parts. I'm using a cool interactive bomb program that I found to uh, process a KiCad bomb output and uh, make a nice interactive screen so you can populate parts by hand. Use my vacuum placement tool, pick parts off of the tape, place them down. I did two boards. I always like to do two when I'm doing an initial prototype. So in case one has issues, I can compare it against the other. Uh, I don't have an oven yet, so I use a board preheater and then I use a, a hot air reflow tool, as you see here, and get the board basically piecewise uh, flowed. And this is the uh, result. So this is the ESP32 module. And we've got the micro SD card socket down here, the flat flex connector for the front panel, JST connector for the RFID, Grove header for the uh, peripherals, this whole section on the bottom is power supply and battery charging stuff. Uh, I've got the 5 volt input and the LiPo input and then that other uh, two pin JST over there is the motor. This uh, section is the uh, 5 volt boost that we talked about as that inductor. Flip it over. Uh, on the other side, we've got a uh, battery disconnect switch, the uh, USB input for that USB to serial, and then a couple of buttons, one that, that reboots the ESP and the other is a bootloader. And these are test points for various uh, voltages on the system. So no matter how awesome we were doing our prototypes and schematics and PC board layouts, the chances are we're still going to run into some problems when we bring this board up for the first time. Really pays to be meticulous, go through the board one subsystem at a time, bring it up, debug it, solve any problems you can. And it's up to you how crazy you want to get with your bodge wire fixes versus making another spin of the board. One or the other could be worth your while. But I can't stress enough how important it is to take good notes as you're going through this process. You're going to forget small details that you need to reflect back into your next revision of the board. And if you don't take notes and you don't have a source you can go back to to review, you're probably going to lose stuff and, and still have a mistake in your second rev. So while those boards were off being fabricated, I took some time to get the mechanicals up to snuff. I used the uh, 3D step export feature from KiCad after I had uh, tracked down and imported a bunch of 3D models for missing components. Um, it's really good to have a good model of your board for checking for interferences. So you can see here uh, the whole front bezel assembly, um, the uh, RFID module, the front panel board, and then this is the uh, 3D printed part that uh, we'll be making the prototypes out of. So there's the button lever, some stuff for the piezo uh, window for the LCD, and uh, some aesthetic stuff on the outside, like the RFID logo and bevels and all that kind of stuff. So with the mechanical design, at least in reasonably good shape for early testing, and most of the electronics battles behind us for the short term, we can go about putting this thing together in the doorknob enclosure to give it a test. So you can see we've got the RFID module down there, uh, the front panel, the flat flex connector that connects between the front panel and the main board. Uh, we've got a motor connector as well, and there's a couple more cables that'll go in before we uh, actually put this all together in the shell. 
So let's see if it all fits. Let's give this a try. So uh, feed the board through that front panel. Put the bezel on. Uh, goes on with four screws. We'll just do two here for the uh, purposes of demonstration. Um, I found putting it putting that flat flex on ahead of time and actually I hot snotted it down just because the connectors are so easy to uh, come undone that I think it's it's easier to do that assembly ahead of time. Hook up the uh, the lipo and the power input, and then you can fit the whole board in there. The wires come through a little slot at the bottom, and then a couple of screws to hold uh, the board onto the bezel. And then uh, the lipo is going to get stuck to the top up there. Um, connect the motor up to the uh, the lock mechanism, and then uh, assemble the back panel onto the front panel. I definitely have to say that I think one of the exciting things as an engineer is when you've spent days and weeks sweating the details mechanically, electronically for some particular project and you're, you're doing your final assembly, you're putting those screws in the case and it all comes together. It is just kind of one of those awesome things about what we do. So perhaps somewhat conveniently, we've been ignoring the important topic of firmware for the ESP32. And again, this somewhat falls victim to the nonlinearity problem that we discussed earlier. It's not like we waited till the very end after all the mechanicals and electronics were done to start on the firmware. In reality, that stuff was started back when the hand-wired prototype was being built, and it's evolved since then. And it will continue to evolve because it's the least developed part of this project. So the first matter to discuss is what environment to write this firmware in. The ESP32 has both an Arduino environment and what's called the ESP IDF, which is a bare metal platform that Espresso themselves provide. Most hobbyists choose the Arduino environment because it's what they understand. They've used it before for years for their other projects, but more experienced firmware developers like to choose the ESP IDF because it is a more professional solution. It has a real-time operating system, plenty of libraries that support most of the base functionality of the system, and it really is the preferred choice if you're trying to build a system for actual production rather than just messing around for hobby purposes. In the ESP IDF, most projects are coded in straight C code rather than C++ like Arduino is. Espressif does provide a lot of good example code that can get you started so that you can get up and running, running the different peripherals that are on the module pretty easily. And it's fairly straightforward if you've done firmware development before to start combining those together to build a larger system. As I mentioned, it uses a real-time operating system called FreeRTOS. It's going to be beyond the scope of this talk to really get in depth with that, but suffice it to say, it's a really nice real-time operating system, open source. You can go out and read all the documentation and learn about it online. All right, so let's get into a little bit of the architecture of the firmware. This actually was derived from the firmware that I started out writing back in 2017, and I just adapted it for the new version of the IDF. So we can see here that the base system consists of FreeRTOS and the ESP IDF. The IDF wraps up a whole bunch of open source software, a bunch of drivers from Espressive, all kinds of stuff that you need to basically make use of this platform. This isn't necessarily an exhaustive list of everything we're using, but generally speaking, we're using the DMA spy driver to run the LCD, GPIO library to talk to the GPIO pins, what's called the LEDC or LED control library, uh, that is actually a PWM LED driver, but in this case, I'm using it to make that piezo beeper beep at different frequencies. Using the serial driver to uh, receive serial data from the RFID module, the SD card library and associated file system drivers for talking to that SD card, networking libraries, including the TCP IP stack, SSL libraries, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, and the Wi-Fi drivers, obviously, uh, for doing networking. And the OTA libraries are over the air. They provide facilities for doing over-the-air firmware updates. On top of all these libraries provided by the IDF, I started developing my own drivers and libraries for the peripherals that are on our board. So there's a display library, a driver for the LCD, uh, some fonts that feed into that. And then on top of that, there is a display task. A task is actually a free RTOS construct, and it is a independently running section of code uh, that can be communicated with typically through a queue or a mailbox. And in this case, I've got a queue that receives things that need to get updated on the display. So if one of the other tasks wants to display the user's name, for example, once they tag in on the RFID, it will inject a message into the display tasks queue. And the display task will at some point wake up, pull a message out of the queue and put that message up on the screen. 
Next up, we've got the door task, which also has a queue, as you can see. And this task is responsible for running the DC motor and driving that motor driver. Uh, remember, it has those two control pins for forward and reverse and stop. So it receives commands from other tasks telling it to open and close the door lock, essentially. Next up, we've got the beeper task, and this also has a queue. This task is responsible for running the piezo beeper that's in the front panel board. Uh, this provides some feedback to the user when they tag in or press the button, for example. Uh, the format of the messages on this queue are basically uh, frequency and duration of the beep that other tasks would like it to play. And we see here, this is the RFID task. This one does not have a queue because currently it's just generating uh, messages for other queues. It sits there and basically looks for messages coming in uh, on the serial port from the RFID module, does some checksumming and decoding of the information received from the RFID reader, and then it also will grab a mutex uh, and search through the uh, data file that's stored on the SD card, looking for the tag that was just uh, scanned in. If it finds it, it outputs messages to some cues to tell it to unlock and put messages up on the screen. If it doesn't find it, it sends out messages saying that the tag is not known. And here we get to one of the largest tasks in the system, the network task. This is broken up into several different pieces. It receives commands to do all kinds of different things. So there is an HTTPS downloader. The API in the authentication backend uh, provides HTTPS endpoints where you can query to get uh, what's called the ACL, the access control list. That is basically a list of RFID tags, member names, and whether or not they're allowed for a particular given resource at our makerspace. That resource may be the front door, or it may be a, a room or a specific tool in the space. There's also an MQTT client. We use MQTT for real-time information between the rat nodes, door bots, all back to the back end. Uh, basically, that way we can generate Slack messages and log messages anytime something happens in the system that we might care about either logging or displaying in real time. The authentication back end also provides a message anytime something changes with permissions in that back end. So if somebody's billing status changes for their membership or a resource manager gives them permission to use a new tool, a message gets sent out over MQTT, the rat nodes pick that up and they go and fetch a new ACL so that they have updated information about who's allowed to use the tool. You can see we've also got an SNTP client, simple network time protocol. The ESP32, as it's implemented, doesn't have a real-time clock in it, an external real-time clock like battery-backed. So we use the fact that we're on the network, we can go and pull down current time and stay in sync that way. And before I mention those OTA update libraries, well, we've got a piece of the network task that's going to be dedicated to doing OTA updates because once these things are installed on doors or cabinets or wherever they get used, we don't really want to have to pull them apart to do firmware updates. So there's going to be a secure way to use over-the-air updating to get new code into them when necessary. And lastly, we've got this system task, which is currently responsible for kind of housekeeping functions. Mainly right now, it's looking at uh, power management stuff. It is looking to see if uh, that power loss signal that we saw earlier in the power supply design is uh, active. It will pay attention to whether the battery is low, and it will shut the system down if that is the case. So by no means do I consider this firmware even reasonable at this point. It's, it's just a starting point to exercise the hardware. Like I said, it was derived from the firmware that I started back in 2017. A lot of the basic functionality is there, but the overall flow of the system is lacking. So my intention is to basically re-architect this so that there's a centralized task that's kind of managing the overall state of the system and dealing with all the other subtasks uh, in an appropriate manner. If you're interested in taking a look at the code, even as it stands now, uh, you can take a look at our GitHub. Uh, that link will be posted at the end of this video. I don't necessarily recommend this as the basis for any other projects at this point, but by the time we're actually putting this thing into production, the code could be a good starting point for one of your projects. So let's take that red pill that Morpheus offered us and get back to reality here. Let's do a little bit of a bench test before we go install this on the door downstairs. You can see I'm scanning RFID tags, testing out the lock mechanism. Front panel display and button and piezo beeper are working. Looks like it's all in good shape. So we can go put this on a real door and see it work in the real world. So here's the moment of truth. Valid RFID scan, hear the motor run, and the door works. 
I know it seems like it took forever to get here. It's a very simple end result. All we're trying to do is open up a door. But with all these projects, the devil is really in the details. You have to pay attention to so many small things, and to have everything come together and work successfully is a bit of a challenge. So, I'm glad we made it here. Thanks for sitting with me through this, and I hope you enjoyed it.